So this morning, we, Luke is going to come and uh, speak to us, challenge us on this encounter where Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verses 1 to 30. Now Jesus learned that he, that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water. He told her, Go. Call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the, pl- the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do know, do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Luke, I invite you to come. And to share, and I'm going to pray for you before you do. Father God, this morning we thank you for your word, for what it teaches us, for what it reveals about your son Jesus, his nature, and the way that he interacts with people. Come, Lord Jesus, by your spirit, meet with us, challenge us in the same way you did in this account, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. Before we start, a few weeks ago, you would not believe 
how many people came up to me before the service and said to me, Argyle are on telly today, can you keep it short? <laughs> now, I just want to say today that if you don't see me at the end of the service at around 25 past 12, it has nothing to do with the fact that Portsmouth are on telly this afternoon. But if you want to know what it means to watch a decent team, I suggest you tune in at about 12.30 yourself this afternoon. But it is good to see you today. And today we draw our sermon series on distinctive discipleship to a close. Over the course of the past few weeks together, we have explored the fact together that to be a distinctive disciple of Jesus, to go deeper with him, we need to be a people who learn to walk closely with Christ. We need to be, learn to be a people who follow him wholeheartedly, who are grounded in the words, who understand the importance of meeting together and to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have within us. And as I said last week, when we talk about a list of things like we have talked about together over the last month or so, it's very easy for us to come to the conclusion by looking at these things, well, I need to try harder. I'm not quite hitting the mark at the moment and I need to do something about it. And as I said last week, when we focus on a list like this, and that's the conclusion that we come to, what we end up doing at times is trying harder and maybe setting ourselves goals and targets. I'm going to get up extra early every single day to read my Bible and to pray. And maybe we do that for a day or two, or if we're really spiritual, a week. But then we find ourselves falling back into our old habits and our old grooves and our old ruts, and we become disillusioned and disappointed at that very fact. I mean, we want to grow closer to God, but it just seems so hard. And I think we see a biblical outworking of our own struggles when we look at what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll know the story. Jesus has a last supper with his disciples, and then they go off to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus takes Peter, James, and John a little bit further ahead with him, and he says to these three, listen, guys, I want you to stay here, and I want you to pray while I go off and pray and be with my Father. And that's what Jesus does. He goes off on his own, and he spends some time with his Father, and an hour later, he comes back and what does he find he finds Peter James and John asleep and he says to them could you not have stayed awake for just one hour and prayed the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and then he goes off for a second time to pray and I don't know about you but I'm thinking if I'm Peter James or John I would have said to the others listen lads this is really important to Jesus we need to stay awake right now and we need to pray we can't fall asleep again but what happens Jesus comes back a second time and he finds them asleep. You see, good intentions on their own are not enough. We need to do something about it that is different than simply just setting targets because our spirit might be willing, but often we find our flesh is weak. So trying harder on its own is not enough. So what is going to help us to become distinctive disciples? As we said last week, the motivation is love. That has to be the driving force for our discipleship. When we love someone, our motivation to please them is easy. We want to spend time with them. We want to talk with them. It comes naturally to us and it's not a chore. And with that in mind, as we close our series together today looking at what it means to be a distinctive disciple I want us to focus on the thing which produces intimacy with God more than anything else in our lives the subject of worship and as I mentioned a few weeks ago when we talk about worship worship is probably one of the most divisive subjects in the entire church. It's one of the things that people fall out about more than anything else. Why? Because in many respects, worship is an intensely personal subject. Again, as we touched upon a few weeks ago, the primary goal of our worship is to ascribe the place of worth to God in our lives, to ascribe the place of honour to him in our lives, to give him the glory that he alone deserves. So in that respect, when we talk about worship, worship is never ever about us. It's about giving God his rightful place in our lives. 
But in his grace, when we worship God, he draws close to us. He meets with us. And there's an intimacy with the Almighty in our worship. And our love and our intimacy for God grows. And as a result of that, when we see worship simply about the songs that we sing on a Sunday, it can leave us feeling at times incredibly frustrated and maybe even angry when the songs that we sing are not necessarily the songs that we prefer. Because what it feels like is that there are people who are blocking our intimacy with God because we are not meeting with him in the way that we feel comfortable doing so. Worship is also an intensely personal subject because actually when we come to worship, we actually all worship God from a very different place. There will be some here today who come to worship today full of joy. There's a lot going on in the world right now, but actually you are knowing and experiencing the blessings of God in your life. God feels really close to you and there's an excitement when you come to worship him. A little bit like King David in the Old Testament. I'm sure you well know the story that the Ark of the Covenant was the place where God's presence dwelt in the Old Testament. And this was regained by the people of Israel after losing it at one point. You can read the story for yourself in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And when the Ark of the Covenant, that place where God's presence dwelt, was regained by Israel, David was so overjoyed by this fact. What did he do? He strips down to his pants and he starts dancing before the Lord because he is just so overjoyed with the fact that the Ark of the Covenant is back. And his wife looks at him and she says, how the king of Israel has dismayed himself today and made himself look a fool. To which David replies to her, it's before the Lord that I'm dancing. And you know what? I can become even more undignified than this. Some people, you're not going to strip down to your pants today, but you know the blessings of God in your life at the moment. You know the joy of God in your life, and it is just such a joy to worship him. But there are some here today or who are watching online, and you are worshipping today from a place of pain. There was a man in the Bible called Job. Job was a man who had absolutely everything, health, wealth, possessions, family. And in the blink of an eye, he lost it all. It was all taken from him. And what does he do? He gets down on his knees and he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. His name is worthy to be praised. And maybe some of you today are worshipping God and you're coming to worship from a place of pain, from a place of heartache, from a place of I don't know what is going on in my life right now. And this is one of the reasons that worship is so important to us. If our discipleship, our walk with Jesus is going to have any real depth, it's about learning to worship God in the good times and in the bad. When life is great, And when life is hard, when the song is our choice or the song is a song that we have never, ever heard before. Because it's in learning to praise God in all situations and all circumstances that remind us that the successes in our life are not simply down to us. And the pain and the hurt and the heartache and the failures are not the end of the story. I love the text that we have heard read together today. It's one of my favourite encounters of Jesus in the entire Bible. In it, we see Jesus at his most human. He is tired and he is weary from the journey that he has taken. So he sits down by a well to rest. His disciples, they go off into the town to buy some food. And as they do, and as Jesus rests, a woman comes to the well and she comes to collect water. Now, it's fair to say that this woman had a bit of a questionable reputation. It was the hottest part of the day. It was a time when no one went out to collect water, yet here she was. That probably indicates that this woman was shunned by her own people. And what happens at this well is that this beautiful exchange begins to take place between her and Jesus. It's an exchange which broke all of the cultural norms and rules of the day. Jesus, a Jewish man, should never have been speaking to a Samaritan woman. Men didn't speak to women in public. And if you were a Jewish man, you definitely did not speak to a Samaritan woman. 
Because quite simply, the Jews and the Samaritans, they hated each other. And they would generally do all they could to avoid each other. Yet Jesus, knowing exactly what this woman needed, starts a conversation with her. Because he knew that he could offer her something that no one else could. And he starts talking to this woman about something that she knows about. He strikes up a conversation and he starts talking to her about water. Jesus meets this woman where she is at. And over the course of the conversation, he leads her to a point where she needed to be. He spoke to her about the hope that only he could give. And he touched upon perhaps the sorest part of her life. He began to speak to her about her sin. He said to the woman, go and call your husband. I have no husband, says the woman. You're right when you say you have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the fact is, the man you now live with is not your husband. And perhaps from this woman at this point, in an effort to deflect from the toughest question that she could be asked that day, she attempts to show Jesus that she knows what she's talking about a little bit. And she changes the subject and begins to talk about the subject of religion. And she says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors, they worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place to worship is in Jerusalem. You see, both the Jews and the Samaritans understood that at this point, God had set apart a place where his name was to be known and his presence was to be met. King David had decided that that place was in Jerusalem, where the temple was eventually built. But the Samaritans, they rejected this tradition and they chose the place where Abraham first built an altar at Shechem beneath Mount Gerizim. And Jesus, he lovingly says to this woman, No, 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 no. The place will soon be immaterial. You don't have to worry about the place to meet with God. Because God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And for us today, if we're to be true worshippers of God, if worship is to be about more than the songs that we sing on a Sunday and our lives are meant to be a song of his glory, understanding what Jesus means when he says that God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth is of vital importance to us. And the first thing that we need to understand when we think about these things and this statement that Jesus makes in verse 24, God is spirit and his true worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth, is that God starts off by making a statement about who he is. Just as in other passages of scripture, we read that God is light and God is love, the fact that Jesus tells us that God is spirit describes the way that God reveals himself to his people and he impacts the human hearts. True worship must be in spirit, engaging our whole heart, empowered by God to keep our eyes fully fixed upon him and fully focused on him. We cannot truly worship him unless we worship in spirit. But it also must be in truth. Our worship must be informed by the revelation of who God is as revealed to us in scripture. And one of the traps that many churches find themselves falling into is they compartmentalize these two things, spirit and truth, come spirit or truth. And there are churches, maybe churches that find themselves in the kind of wildly charismatic end of the spectrum, whose worship is all about heart engagement, and as a result, truth can be neglected. But yet there are also churches for whom it's all about truth and as a result the spirit is neglected. The one who empowers our worship is neglected and forgotten about. The one who inclines our hearts towards God in the first place. But when Jesus talks about worshipping in spirit and in truth, he's not talking about something which can be divided. He's talking about one inseparable concept. There's an old saying, isn't there? If we worship in truth without the spirit, we dry up. If we worship in spirit without the truth, we blow up. But if we worship in spirit and in truth, we grow up. 
And I love what Jesus says here and how it echoes other things that he says in the Gospels. So if we were to turn this morning to John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, we would read these words together. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. What Jesus goes on to later reinforce here in the gospel is that ultimately a particular particular place where you worship doesn't matter when it comes to worship because the Holy Spirit dwells within each and every believer. Therefore, worship is actually a whole life, an everyday kind of thing. So when we talk about worship in this context, what are the practical outworkings for us today? If we want to be distinctive disciples, if we recognize that worship is at the heart of who we are, what are the practical outworkings from John chapter 4 that we see? The first that I want us to see today is that when we come to worship, God meets us where we are at. On this day and on that occasion, Jesus met with a Samaritan woman shunned by her own people whose life looked a bit of a mess and engaged with her about something which she understood, water. And in doing so, promised her a water which would never, ever run dry, that would always quench her thirst and that would bring about life in her life. The truth is, today, wherever you are at, whether you feel like you're on a mountaintop with God or you feel like you are in the pit of despair, whether you've got life all together at the moment or whether for you life feels just a little bit of a mess, whether you feel close to God or right now he feels a million miles away from you, if you make a conscious choice today to worship, Jesus will meet you where you are at in whatever situation you are in. James tells us to draw close to God and he will draw close to you. The second practical application that I believe we see in this scripture is that when we try to hide what's really going on in our lives, it separates us from God. Jesus touches on the sorest part of this woman's life, her sin. He doesn't do it to out her, Not because he wants to say to her, everyone was right to shun you. Your life is a mess. But because he wanted to start a healing process in her life, which would ultimately bring about change. And when he did, this woman, she tried to hide who she was and what was really going on. She changed the subject and she deflected what was happening. Whereas in worship, the call is to come. Just as you are, with all your hurts, with all your baggage, with all your pain, with all your mess. You know, as Christians, so often we try to portray that we've got it all together, don't we? As if there's something spiritual about putting on our Sunday best. But if we're to go deeper in our discipleship with Christ, it has to start off where we are at and being honest about what's going on. And with that in mind... There are four ways I believe today that as believers, as disciples of Christ, we can start a journey of worshipping God in spirit and in truth. The first is this. Today, wherever you are at, whatever is going on in your life, make a conscious choice today to worship him. Coming back to the story of Job. Job was a man who lost everything in the blink of an eye. Job was a man who had untold pain come upon him. And he faced a choice. And he chose, in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that hurt, and in the midst of that heartache, to worship God. You know, when the depth of our worship is restricted to what we sing, feelings will ultimately govern how we worship But if we're to be a people who worship in spirit and in choice, uh, in in truth, it starts with a choice. It starts with saying, no matter what the band play, no matter how I feel today, no matter what's going on in my life right now, I choose to worship because you are worthy, God. And if we're going to be distinctive disciples, 
This is where worship in spirit and in truth starts, by choosing to worship him. That's what Paul was getting at when he said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or whether I'm hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today, make a choice to worship him. The second thing to do for us, the practical outworkings of worshipping in spirit and in truth, is to ask God to search our hearts. If worshipping in spirit means allowing the Holy Spirit to engage our hearts, we should simply start by asking him to search us. Psalm 139, 23 says this, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Today, if we're going to be a worshipping disciple, we start simply by saying, God, search me. Invite him and be prepared to see what he reveals to us. The third is simply this, don't be afraid. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When we draw close to God, when we realise who we are in the light of who he is, we also realise that nothing can separate us from God's love. We don't have to have it all together. We don't have to hit the perfect harmony. Our life doesn't have to be in order. But just like Jesus did with this Samaritan woman, recognise that at times Jesus will lovingly and gently challenge where we are at and the aspects of our life that need change in order to lead us to a point where he can make a difference. Finally, as we draw close to God, allow him to do a work of refinement in your life. We read these words together in Matthew, uh, Malachi chapter 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in the days gone by, as in the former years. When a silversmith refines silver, he goes for a process of melting it, holding it over the hottest part of the fire, And when he does, the dross comes to the top and he's able to wipe the dross away. And what it leaves is just pure silver or pure gold. And what we see in the story of this Samaritan woman is exactly that. Jesus meets with this woman and through a conversation, the dross bubbles to the top and eventually Jesus deals with it. And I love how this story finishes. She arrives at the well to collect some water. But she leaves, and when she leaves, she leaves her water jug behind, and she runs into the village, and she says, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Isn't that amazing? The thing that she went for in the first place, the reason that she was there, she was there to collect water, no longer mattered to her. She had this encounter with Jesus, and it changed her forever. And just like this woman... It's in worship that we meet with Jesus through his spirit. We understand him through his truth and our lives are changed forever. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means drawing close to him, abiding in him, following him, learning from him, telling others about him, being on a journey together with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, leaning into him and choosing to live a life of worship. Why? Because he is worthy. So as we draw this series to a close, I wonder how your journey of discipleship is going at the moment. Because wherever it is, this is where it starts. An invitation to come and to drink. Choose to live a life of worship. 
Worship him in spirit and in truth, laying your life bare before him and allowing him to only, only him to do what only he can do. I'm going to pray and I'm going to hand back to Zoe. He's going to lead us in response and in worship. Let's pray together. Father God, forgive us for the times where we see worship as being something which is about us, about our preferences, about our styles, about our wants and about our needs. Today, Lord God, we choose once again to acknowledge that our worship is about ascribing that place of worth, ascribing that place of honour to you in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that in worship, you graciously meet with us, you draw close to us, and you change us. And today, I want to thank you to, uh, today for those who are in this building or watching online who are experiencing a time of blessing in their lives right now, who just want to dance before the Lord for all that you're doing. Lord, we pray more. But Lord, for those who are worshipping in a pit of despair at the moment, for those whose lives feel like they're in a valley and they're far from you, Lord, may the song on their lips still be to God be the glory. And in that time, Lord, God of all comfort, will you draw close to them? And will you meet with them in a very special and powerful way? But Lord, today we pray, may we all choose to live a life that worships you and honours you, not just for the hour and a half that we're together on a Sunday morning, but may our lives sing songs of your glory throughout the week. And what happens when no one sees? In Jesus' name, amen.